There we go. Um, we're going to wrap up periodic properties and things we can make, generalizations we can make from, from the shape of the periodic table. Um, and then we'll start getting into ionic compounds, which is how do we match up these ions, these stable ions, in ways that we can we could predict what the formulas will be, how many of different atoms. So that should be, that's probably review, right? Does everybody remember? You have to have enough positives to match up the negatives so that you can, and then you write how many it takes of each ion. Does that sound somewhat familiar? Okay. So we'll talk about that a little bit today and how to name those compounds. Um, and then we're going to get into some more calculation stuff. It's been a, a bit since we did any sort of calculations, right? Don't want to get too rusty. So we're going to start doing more conversions. Um, just talking about moles of atoms and grams and figuring out how many moles of atoms we have based on grams. So some, some basic um, atomic mass calculations. So the last periodic property that we're going to really talk about we talked about valence electrons. We talked about atomic radius. Um, ionization energy is kind of exactly what it sounds like, but it's also very specific. So ionization energy sounds like the amount of energy to make something an ion, right? Um, which is what this term means, that the additional wrinkle is specifically the energy to take an electron away from something. So it's the energy to make something a positive ion, not just any ion, specifically a positive ion. Um, and in general, what, so what do we know about, talk about fluorine. Fluorine has how many, when it's neutral, has how many valence electrons? Seven. Um, we won't get into Lewis dot structures just yet, but if we have seven valence electrons, so 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, sorry, 2p5. If we want to make this more stable, we want to have all of these either full or empty, right? And if we have, what's the easiest way to do that? Is to, is to give it an extra electron, right? Does that... Is it going to be easy to take an electron away? Is that going to make it, be making it more stable to take an electron away? Now, in general, it's so close to being stable just by gaining one electron that to take an electron away from something that's either stable or really close to being stable is really hard to do. It takes a lot of energy to pull an electron away from fluorine. We looked at sodium, though, on the other hand. Got 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s1 when it's neutral, right? Is that going to be easy to take an electron away from? Yeah, because we're going to be making something more stable. If we can take an electron away from sodium, all that's left is going to be completely filled energy levels or completely empty energy levels. So in general, ionization energy goes up when you go towards the top right of the periodic table. When you're going from left to right across a row, as you go from left to right, it gets harder and harder to take an electron away because you're getting more and more, you're getting closer and closer to having a completely filled energy level. What about and that, so that kind of makes sense with our understanding of orbitals, right? This is the reason we talk about orbitals before we talk about all this stuff, because all of these other properties come back to the orbitals and number of protons things have. What have we talked about chlorine? Still seven valence electrons, right? Just 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p5. So similar chemical properties, that's why they're in the same column. If we were going to take an electron away from one of these, which one's gonna be easier to take an electron away from? Why? Fewer shells to go through this thing. It's the exact right logic, but with the wrong outcome. It's easier to take one away from fluorine because it's got these other shells that kind of run interference. 
the protons in the nu in the nucleus are pulling these electrons in, right? Well, if there's a whole bunch of other electrons in between the outermost electrons and the nucleus, there's basically, they call it screening. Those, these core electrons screen the outermost, the valence electrons from the nucleus. And so they're not pulled in as tightly. So in general, when you go, not in general, I think this one's universal. I, I generally don't use absolutes, um, but this one I don't think has any exceptions. In the same column, when you go down one row, that, I, I can't help but hedge with my language. That almost always will guarantee um, that it's easier to take an electron away. So it's easier to take an electron away from bromine than from chlorine. Easier to take one away from chlorine than it is from fluorine. That's, that's the exception. I knew there was an exception in there somewhere. Um, hydrogen can sometimes be put in row in column 17 because it has it only needs to gain one electron to have a full energy level but hydrogen's electron is easier to take away than fluorine's electron but don't worry about that too much right now uh, so that's our last periodic property i guess there's a flip side to this though too so the the further you get to, towards the top right, the harder it is to take an electron away. So, which means increase in ionization energy. There's another property that's sort of the opposite of ionization energy. Can anybody, if ionization energy is the energy required to take away an electron, what's the opposite property? how readily it accepts an electron, right? And so we call that electron affinity. What does affinity mean? I know I always turn this into an English class, but um, what does the word affinity mean? Anybody have a definition for just common use? Yeah, if you like something, you have an affinity for it. Or if you're good at something, you have an affinity for it. Um, electron affinity for an element means basically how readily do they grab an electron and hold on to it. So, but it's, it's kind of framed in the opposite terms. Ionization energy is how much energy do you have to put in to take something away? So high ionization energy means it's hard to take an electron away. Electron affinity is how much it wants to gain an electron. And so we wind up with if something has high ionization energy, blah, kind of turned that into motion out there. High ionization energy, it typically will also have high electron affinity. So fluorine has really high ionization energy, closer to the top right. It also has a high electron affinity. It wants to gain an electron really badly because gaining one electron makes it stable. All right, so electron affinity and ionization energy generally go up as you go to the top right. Um, especially if you leave off column 18. Why would column 18 make that generalization weird? They don't want to gain an electron or lose an electron. For everything else, it either wants, if it wants to gain an electron, it really doesn't want to lose an electron, right? But the noble gases don't want to do either. Right, so column 18 is where this that trend breaks down. And usually um, because the noble gases are so boring um, and don't really do much of anything, I usually will make statements like closer to the top right and then I'll remember, oh, except for column 18, ignore them because they don't do anything. Um, in fact, that's where the term noble gas comes from. There's two ways to interpret that. Um, noble gases are called noble gases because they don't react. It's very Downton Abbey. Oh, you know, when something happens, stiff upper lip, no, no emotion shown, um, like traditional nobles in Europe. And the other way, the way I perceive, I prefer to think about it is they don't do anything. Um, they don't do anything. So they're nobles. Um, they just kind of sit there. They are for whatever reason. And that's that.
Um, either way, when I make the, these trends, when we're talking about ionization energy and electron affinity, we're generally going to ignore the noble gases um, because that's kind of where some of our trends break. Um, there's also this term that I kind of leave off a lot of the time called metallic character. Metallic character is really kind of the sum of a bunch of these other properties. So metallic character just in, in English terms just means how metal is it? Um, and in general, that kind of comes down to how do you define a metal? We're not talking about Black Sabbath. How do you define a metal on the periodic table or in everyday life? What makes something metallic? Yeah, it's shine. It, typically they have a shine to them to some extent, but other stuff can be shiny too, right? So how else could we define metal? Cash? It's malleable. Yeah, we, we used that term before, right? Um, it's malleus means hammer in Latin. Malleable, literally you hammer it flat. I said we were talking about the Rutherford gold foil experiment, right? Um, so if it's malleable, the other term that's kind of related is called ductile, which is a weird word. Something is ductile if you can grab it and pull it and stretch it into a new shape. So metals tend to be pretty ductile. Um, even things that are shiny tend to not necessarily be ductile unless they're a metal. Think about something like, like a diamond or a piece of glass. If glass is at room temperature and you try to grab both ends and stretch it, what's going to happen? It's going to break, right? And same if you try to hammer it. If you try to hit a piece of glass with a hammer, I think we all know how that's going to end up. Um, so that actually, those two properties, along with the, the sheen, how shiny it is, um, and it's thermal and, and electrical conductivity. So these are all properties, thermal and electrical conductivity, things that are better at transmitting heat quickly. So conductivity specifically just means not is it conductive, but also how quickly does it does it conduct heat or um, electricity? And metals tend to have high thermal and electrical conductivities as well. Anybody who's ever picked up a, you know, a penny off the ground that's been sitting in the sun in the summer, it'll burn your hand for a second, right? It, metals don't actually store that much heat compared to water, but they give it away really quickly. And that's why it can feel like you burn yourself. You know, it doesn't feel like it does burn for a second, right? Um, that's because it's got that thermal conductivity. Um, there's just something else I was going to say about that. Oh, we'll get there. Um, where would we expect to see more metallic character? Where are things going to be better at having electrical conductivity? How is that going to be related to, say, ionization energy? Not that, so he, the charge does factor into it, but he, so what's going to, what about the charge? Okay, so yes. It's tied to the charge, but not the, the ions themselves are not conductive. Only when they're neutral are metals conductive. But when they have low charges, they tend to also be, when they're metals that become more stable with a low charge, be careful with my language there, they tend to also be very good at being electrical conductors as well. Um, so things that have a low ionization energy tend to be more metallic. So on the periodic table, what corner is gonna have the most electrical conduct? What corner has the, the lowest ionization energy? Bottom left, 
top right was the the highest ionization energy, the hardest to take an electron away. So bottom left is going to be the easiest to take an electron away. In fact, francium and cesium actually have a positive ionization energy, um, which means they will actually spontaneously fling electrons off into space without having anything to accept them. Most everything else, you actually have to have something else that can accept the electron before you'll actually lose an electron. Um, cesium and francium will actually just spontaneously throw electrons away into empty space. Um, it's a little bit like a radioactive, like radioactivity, but different at the same time. Um, yeah, they actually would be the most metallic and they have the highest electrical conductivity. Yeah. When you hear about like gold is the best conductor, is that the best stable conductor? Now? The best stable conductor. We don't really want, if we have francium that's just going to randomly throw electrons off into space, we don't really want to make wiring circuits out of that, right? Um, even without going that extreme, potassium, as it, when it's in its metallic state, is reactive enough that just moisture in the air can cause it to spontaneously ignite. Um, we don't really want to build electrical circuits out of that, even though it is very, very malleable, very, very ductile. Um, we actually have some metallic potassium in the stockroom at, uh, um, at LTCC, and it's so soft, it's almost like Play-Doh. You can basically like squeeze it with your hands. You don't even need a hammer. You squeeze it with your, you can cut it with a butter knife. Um, it would make a really good circuit if it wasn't so reactive. So we typically use things that are more stable, that are also more metallic, like gold and copper. Silver also would make a pretty good conductor as well, but not that much better than copper. So we don't usually see that because that costs almost as much as gold. Um, without being as as good of a conductor. Um, so and it is kind of kind of hand wavy a little bit. So I'm not going to generally test you on metallic character because it's kind of like a sum of all of these properties. And it still comes back to ionization energy. So if we can think about ionization energy, things that have low ionization energy are also more metallic by these standards. Um, you're just not used to seeing them as metals. We don't think about sodium as being a metal uh, or having metallic character because it's so reactive. The ductility, how ductile something is, is always a weird property to think about too. Because, but it, it's also weird to think about that it was a technological advance. It was a scientific discovery when they realized you could just grab a piece of copper and pull it really hard and turn it into copper wire. Um, but that's what ductile literally means. You literally can just pull on a metal and stretch it out like silly putty. It's just not, you just have to do a little bit more force than silly putty. So you need some mechanical advantages there. Um, but yeah, copper wire was actually a very big technological advance um, that really only only became um, all popular in the in the early 1900s, which is why older houses still have non-copper wiring, a ball and tube wiring, um, because they didn't have copper wire available to them. All right, we talked about about the uh, filling the valence shells and figuring out what the charges are likely to be the stable charges. Um, so ignore the top part for a second. This is what we were kind of talking about the other day, right? When we're talking about this, predicting the charges on the metals, most of the metals are going to have more than one possible charge. So other than column one and two, and these six that all kind of follow the same logic, right? So aluminum, gallium, and indium, what's their stable charge? How many valence electrons they have? Three. So they're stable when they're a plus three charge. Zinc and cadmium. How many valence electrons? Two. Remember, the D block doesn't count as valence electrons. So they're going to be more stable when they're plus two. They only have both plus two as a charge or neutral. Um, in stable charges. 
And then silver was our irregular one, but there's only one and it goes three, two, one. So there's a lot of mnemonic devices you can use to remember that silver when it's an ion is always gonna be plus one. The rest of the, the metals can have more than one possible charge that's stable. Um, in fact, some of them have five, six possible charges that are stable enough we can create them in a lab and, and make a compound with those charges. Um, so rather than try to memorize that, the old school way of doing this is that, um, there's most of them have, you know, two stable-ish charges. And so you would just say there's either, it's either the cupric ion or the cuprous ion in, um, in the case of copper. So copper, could, when it's charged, can be plus two or plus one. The plus one we used to be called cuprous ion and plus two was cupric ion because the Latin word for copper is uh, cuprum, which so hence Cu instead of Co for, for its atomic symbol. The thing is, is that these suffixes don't, they're not really universal because iron on the other hand can be plus three or plus two. But they would still call this one ferric and this one ferris. So basically whatever is the highest possible charge gets, gets an ick thrown on the end of it. And the, and the lower charge gets OUS thrown onto the end. But you still had to know what these possible charges were, which was a lot of memorizing. So what the way we do it now is instead of calling it the cupric ion, we just call it a copper two ion. Use Roman numerals in parentheses. So a copper two ion is the, the way to say in English, Cu2 plus. Right? It's not how many coppers you have. When we get into the formulas in a second, we're gonna see that it's kind of tempting to, to numbers as how many of each ion you have. If we say the word copper, then two, we're talking about the charge on the copper, not how many we have. And so then what would the, what would the name be for the, for a uh, cuprous ion? It's not copper two, it's copper one. It's a really straightforward, simple way to say both what the metal is and what the charge is, right? Just say the charge. And it's brilliant. Why didn't anybody think of that before? Why did we have this in the first place? Well, because the first chemists were really alchemists and court magicians who liked to obscure their knowledge instead of sharing knowledge. It was like a, a gatekeeping, a way to keep people out from knowing things, was to hide it behind all of this really obscure language and required memorization. We're still getting past that as a, as a field um, in chemistry. But here's a good move towards that. You just say this. So what are these two ions? What's the top one? Iron three, iron two. Um, this also helps because not everything is limited to just two of these. If I pull up that detailed periodic table again, it also, not only does it have the uh, electron configurations on there, like I showed you the other day, it also has These numbers at the bottom under the electron configuration are the possible charges that that ion can have, that that metal can have as an ion. And so all, they can all be neutral, which is what we call their metallic state. When they have a charge of zero, that's when they're metals. Um, they're metal ions when they have any other one, but see, iridium has four possible charges. It can be plus two, plus three, plus four, plus six. So this system wouldn't work for that anyway. Because we basically only have two chart, two abilities or ways we can describe them. So we just say, okay, we have, I've got iridium four ion or iridium six ion or chromium. Chromium is another one that has a bunch of possibilities. 
You said to me earlier about to have a smaller charge that it would be a better conductor. So would you say that copper one would be a better conductor than copper two? And I, I had to go back and correct my language on that because it's they're not actually very conductive once they're ions. The metals that have lower charges when they're ions, when they're neutral, also tend to be better conductors. Um, but that that's also a generalization that has lots of of um, exceptions to it. Uh, remember, I mentioned that there's a whole bunch of different ways of drawing the periodic table. Um, but there's an online version that actually lets us sort by various properties, conductivity, thermal, electric. Uh, so, and actually these, these ones, right, that are one away from having both the orbital are actually better conductors. So that actually does get away from that. Um, from that general trend. Sure. One more reason why I'm not going to test you on metallic character, because it does have a lot of irregulars to it. Um, it actually does say up, up is it left? Well, that's that's backwards from what I actually, a metallic character, all of that trend, the electrical conductivity, it looks like doesn't map that entirely. Huh. How about that? But, Ionization energy does follow our trend really closely. Right? Closer to the top right means less, it's harder to take an electron away. Bottom left is easier to take an electron away. All right. So, Um, one, um, so let's talk about combining ions together and making ionic compounds. So a compound is anything that's made up of more than one, more than one element where they, they always have to be combined in the same ratio. So this is part of what led to Dalton's discovery of, of the atomic theory um, was the idea that you can't just kind of have a little bit more of one element, right? They always have to be combined in the same ratio, same number of atoms to from of one element to the same number of atoms of another element. Um, and with these ionic compounds, that ratio is governed by how do we make the charges add up to zero? So pretty much across the board, um, having having charges on something makes it less stable in every day in the real world. It might make the atom more stable if it's if we were able to fill or empty a valence property properly, but that doesn't mean that it's stable in the real world. When you have ions floating around, they tend to stick to other things. Because what what is a negative ion going to be attracted to? anything with a positive charge, right? And so if you have all these ions floating around, they tend to stick together. So for instance, if we had a copper two ion floating around and it bumps into a chloride ion with a negative one charge, they're going to tend to stick together, right? Opposites track, that's where that term comes from, um, is that, charges, electrical charges that are opposite, attract each other and stick together. But if we see, stick just one chloride on there, their charges don't totally match up, don't totally um, disappear, right? Because we had a plus two here and a minus one here. That still doesn't add up to zero, right? So we still wind up with something that has a net charge to it. So ionic compounds that are stable occur when we when we get the ratio of atoms right, ions right, so that their charges add up to zero. When you get something that's totally neutral, 
that's going to be more stable than having a charge. And if we can get something that's totally neutral and all the valences are filled or empty, that's even better. Right. So the way we describe a ionic compound is we just describe how many of each ion do we have. We need the charges to add up to zero. So you basically just take a column A, a little bit from column B, and you mix them together till their charges add up to zero. And the formula, the ionic formula for this compound is always gonna be the lowest whole number ratio that lets the charges add up to zero. Covalent compounds don't always behave like that. So for covalent compounds, that lowest whole number ratio goes out the window. But for ionic compounds, where you have something with a positive charge and something with a negative charge, the formula for that compound is always gonna be the lowest whole number ratio that adds up to zero. All right, so and this is another one of these, I, I, when I type this, I type always, um, and I don't like that because it's not always. You don't actually need a metal and a non-metal. You need a positive ion and a negative ion. Um, does anybody know what the term is? If we're talking about an ion that specifically is a positive ion, there's a specific term for that. Does anybody know what that is? Cation, right. Um, I came across this term in a book before I'd heard it spoken out loud. So I always thought it was cation when I was little. Um, no, it's cation. Um, what's the term for a negative? Anion. Lots of ways you can remember that. It seems like a lot of you have that down. Um, I always just remember an anion. A-N stands for a negative ion. Anion, easy. And cation, the T looks like a plus or cats are a positive thing in your life. I don't know if you like cats or not, but I like cats. Oh. Um, it actually, and actually using that base actually does show up in other places. Cause when we start talking about batteries, batteries ha um, have cathodes and anodes. Cathodes are positively charged. Anodes are negatively charged because they come from the same base. Anode, A-N. Um, so that winds up being, you know, getting that down, making that connection winds up being helpful down the road. Um, when we're naming these compounds, we want to describe what the name is. We can just say the formula if we want. That's one way to describe this compound, right? We're just going to say the formula. We just literally say CuCl2. Um, that's not always the best way to communicate things by using the formula. Sometimes we wanna have a name that can be typed out or written out. So for ionic compounds, it's really easy. You just say the name of each ion. Um, you start with the cation. And I don't know if that's because on, on a traditional periodic table, the metals are on the left and the non-metals are on the right. Um, that's one good way you could remember it though, is you start with the cation and then you say the name of the anion. So name here, well, what's the name of that cation? Copper two. And what's the name of the anion? Ah, uh, we didn't actually say how to do that yet. When some when a non-metal has a has a charge, it's gonna have a negative charge. And to indicate it has a negative charge, we change the ending of the element to be eyed. Anytime you hear something end with "-ide", that means it's a negative ion. That means it's an anion. So when chlorine, if it's chlorine, a chlorine atom that's neutral, we just call it chlorine atom or chlorine gas. Um, when we talk about covalent compounds, we'll explain why this makes more sense. Um, we say chlorine, we mean one of these two things, either a chlorine atom or chlorine gas. We say chloride, that means we took that chlorine atom and we gave it one extra electron. So the name for this compound is literally just say the name of the cation, say the name of the anion. So copper two chloride. What do we get with calcium and oxygen? We can predict these charges now from the periodic table, right? 
what is the formula going to be? How many of each atom do we need to make an ionic compound out of calcium and oxygen? What's the charge going to be on a calcium ion? Two plus, it's in the second column, right? No exceptions to those ones. So column two is always, when it's an ion, it's always plus two. What's the charge on an oxygen ion? Minus two, it needs to gain two electrons, which makes it, <clears throat> it's not oxygen anymore, it's oxide. What's the name of this ion? Do we need the two? Because it's always the same charge. When calcium is an ion, a calcium ion is always plus two. So what's the formula that we would that we would get to make these add up to zero? One of each, right? What's the name of that compound? Just calcium oxide. How about uh, potassium and sulfur is one's listed up there, but let's do aluminum and, uh, and sulfur. What's the charge on an aluminum ion? Plus three. We don't need to say aluminum three, right? Because aluminum is one of our special metals that always has the same charge as an ion, right? It's one of those six that are in the, the transition metals um, where we don't need to specify a charge. And so that's just aluminum ion, or if you're feeling British aluminum. A good friend of mine is from Australia. In Australia, they use the, the British pronunciation. So taking chemistry classes with, with him was always was always interesting because we had to keep, no, it's aluminum. Um, you can say aluminum. People are just going to look feel like you're weird. It's the exact same um, thing, though. They just have an extra syllable in it uh, on the British periodic table. And actually, there are some other British spellings on the periodic table. Um, sulfur in particular. Sulfur is spelled with an F if you're in the US and spelled with a PH if you're in England. Pronounced the same way though. Um, and I think phosphorus might have an extra U in it somewhere. Now there's there's one or two other elements that are spelled the cesium. Cesium is spelled C-A-E. Because in in British English, that's the same as C E S. Um, an A and an E together is kind. Of, although that that even doesn't follow a lot of the traditional pronunciations. Um, what's the charge going to be on a sulfur anion? Negative two, just like oxygen, right? So that's not sulfur, that's sulfide. So the name of this compound is just gonna be aluminum sulfide. What's the formula? We need the lowest whole number ratio that adds up to zero. So that's gonna be two positive ions, two cations, and three anions. All right, there's one more point I want to make about this. This is pretty, once you get the hang of it and figure out what which ones you need to say a number after and which ones you don't, this is pretty straightforward, right? Uh, let's look at We'll do 
iron three oxide. What's the formula gonna be for iron three oxide? Iron three, same ratio we just had with the aluminum oxide, right? Two cations and three anions will add up to zero, right? So the formula will be Fe2O3. And the name is iron three oxide. The point I wanna make here is to make sure you don't mix and match formulas and names. If you're saying the elemental symbols, the atomic symbols, you're saying the formula and any numbers that you throw in there are the subscript saying how many you have. So it's Fe2O3, if we're saying the formula, the name is iron three oxide. The temptation, and I see this every year, no matter how many times I go over it, but I don't wanna see it this year. So let's be the exception this year. People always try to turn this into the subscript. If I say iron three oxide, they try to say, they think that means three irons. No, it means that the charge on the iron is a plus three. That's why I started by saying the name of the ion is just the element and then the number of the charge. But that's what you have to keep track of. If you're saying the formula, you're, then any numbers are the subscripts or how many you have. If you're saying the name, then you, the number is talking about the charge on the ion. Okay. Again, it's one of these things that as long as I'm up here doing the example problems for you, that's easy to keep straight. When I give you a blank piece of paper and tell you to do this, um, it's easy to get that mixed up. But we're gonna do better this year than I've ever had a class do before, right? We're not gonna mix that up. All right, that's what I like to hear. Make sure you fill in the people that aren't here, that we're not messing this up this year, okay? All right. Uh, So this is just more of the same thing we were talking about. Um, if you are given a formula, writing the name is pretty straightforward. You just, sometimes you have to work backwards to figure out what the charge is on an element, if it's a transition metal. Um, and there are a couple irregulars when it comes to changing the ending of the name to ides. So it's not oxygide, it's oxide, right? When you um, you, you all did that kind of intuitively when I said, what is oxygen called when it has a negative two charge? Everybody said oxide. But following a regular rule of just drop the last syllable and replace it with ide, it would be oxygide, which sounds weird, right? Usually your ear is actually pretty good. You've heard enough of these terms that usually you can trust yourself on that. It's not, it's not uh, phos phosphoride. That would phosphoride would be the name that we would predict based on this rule. What is it actually? Phosphide. Right, so I'm, but then again, I'm not really going to mark you down that much. You forget to take off that extra syllable, um, but it will sound weird to you. Uh, anything worth going over? Um, so you can make funny words with ionic compounds, not really funny words. The word RBI is not really a funny word by any stretch, but you can make abbreviations and things like that um, with actual chemical compounds. What is the name of the compound RBI? You have rubidium, does rubidium need a, a, a numeral in front of it? No, it's in column one, rubidium iodide. How about BASE? Barium, selenium, we drop the EM and we replace it with ide, so it's barium selenide. The other one that always gets people, um, I get in a note on capitalization, uh, chemical names are not 
are not proper nouns, so you don't have to capitalize them or elements. Um, you will only capitalize them if it's at the beginning of a sentence, like any other noun. Um, but for whatever reason, probably because so many of them are named after people, um, it seems like you should capitalize chemicals, but you don't need to. Again, not something I'm going to mark you down on, but just for your own personal edification. Um, let's see, what's the other one? Let's, let's do... B is one that a lot more people miss than I was expecting. It's in the it's in the first row of the D block. But, and I will say on the grading on the quizzes, I did take off a half a point if you left out that second A in vanadium, right? Because that drops a whole syllable, doesn't it? Vanadium becomes vandium if you do that, um, which is really close, but still that's dropping a syllable. So I did take off a half a point for that. Um, How do we know what the charge on the vanadium is going to be from the TE? We know that the tellurium is going to have what charge when it's stable? Minus, it has to gain two electrons, which gives it a negative two charge. Uh, and if you feel a gaining two electrons, giving something a negative charge is backwards, you're absolutely correct. Uh, and you can blame Benjamin Franklin with his whole kite, flying kites and rainstorms and whatnot. He is the one who decided if you rub rabbit fur on glass, you generate static electricity. And he just arbitrarily said um, that the charge that's left on the rabbit fur is positive and the charge on the glass is negative. And that's so he defined whether an electron was positive or negative. And because he guessed wrong, he had a 50 50 shot in his defense. Yeah. Um, but that's why the charges on electrons are negative and gaining an electron can make something uh, ne negative. Um, so blame Ben Franklin. So what's the name of this compound then? Vanadium two. And then what's the name of this ion? It's tellurium. Yeah, which seems wrong, right? Why, has anybody seen that word show up anywhere else? Like Telluride, Colorado, it's a town in Colorado, um, ski town. I don't know if tellurium is named after Telluride or the other way around. Um, but for whatever reason, that is the proper way to say tellurium with a negative two charge is telluride. Um, so just, just for your own awareness. So this is vanadium two telluride. Again, the two is not referring to how many of anything we have. VTE is the formula. The name would be vanadium two telluride. Okay. Any other questions about naming these ionic compounds? Um, there's plenty more practice if you want more practice. Uh, there's telluride showing up again. Telluride, cadmium two telluride. Actually, the two is done. No, yeah, the two is redundant. Um, cadmium telluride is actually compound that shows up a fair bit in um, solar cell research. Uh, it's one of the one of the alternatives to just using silicon to make a solar cells is to make a CAD telluride um, solar cell that has slightly different properties. So for different applications, you can use different materials for those solar cells. Um, and since my research background was in photovoltaics, that's something that I heard all the time. So I like to use this as an example. Even though I didn't get it right in my exam. All right. What's MN? Just to recap, since that was another one that showed up. Manganese. It's not magnesium, right? 
Mg is not manganese. Just to drive that point. All right, we have 20 minutes left. Let's do some math. So let's talk about atomic mass. We've talked about atomic mass a little bit in terms of, of talking about isotopes and talking about how the structure of the periodic table. Um, this is the work, but I, I messed with the animation I was supposed to show up after I clicked. Um, so basically, atomic mass has units. The, the units aren't written on the periodic table. Um, but the units on the periodic table on the atomic mass officially are AMU, which literally stands for atomic mass unit. It's a somewhat arbitrary um, size that is just chosen so that everything on the periodic table is greater than one, basically. So we're not dealing with any... Um, any decimals or any masses that are less than one AMU if we're talking about atoms. If we're talking about electrons, of course, that all goes out the window, but don't worry about that. Um, the definition originally <clears throat> of one AMU was that it was the, that it was the mass of a single hydrogen atom. Um, that didn't last forever because they wound up, well, are we talking about isotope? Are we talking about hydrogen on earth is a mixture of two different isotopes. So to get around that, they had to redefine it. Um, and they actually want, so they redefined it in terms of carbon. And so one, 12 AMU is the mass, exactly 12 AMU is the mass of a carbon 12 nucleus. Um, and what that comes out to is 1.6605 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms. So 0 0.26 zeros, then 166 kilograms. Really, really small number, right? So in, even if we have something like protein, proteins regularly have masses that are in the um, hundreds of thousands of AMU. Even if we have a protein that's 4.72 times 10 to the 5 AMU, so 472,000 AMU, it still winds up being a tiny mass in terms of what we can actually measure. It's still going to be 7.86 times 10 to the minus 19 grams per molecule of that protein. And that's a huge protein. Most things we're talking about don't have masses anywhere near that large. So we want to talk about compounds in terms of individual atoms, but we can't actually count individual atoms because that they're just too small. Uh, but, you know, it would take, we do the, well, I don't think we did use that example. Um, we'll get there in a second. So how do we, actually count this and keep it into things that we can we can measure. Um, we actually deal not in one atom at a time or even a hundred thousand atoms at a time. We deal in moles of atoms. And a mole is just some a somewhat arbitrary number um, called Avogadro's number, which is usually abbreviated capital N sub A. And it's just a, a number of objects. And so this should be familiar. Um, that's Avogadro's number. One mole of anything is 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd of that object. So in the example that gets used all the time, it's like saying you have a dozen of something. If I just say I have a dozen, that's not a complete unit, is it? A dozen doesn't tell you what we're talking about. So a dozen is just a way of saying I have 12, and then you still need to follow it in with 12 what, right? A mole is the same thing. You can't just say I have a mole. I have a mole of something, of a particular compound. I have a mole of hydrogen atoms. Um, and this is the Avogadro's number, the 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd, is 
a measured number. It's defined as the number of carbon atoms in 12 grams of carbon 12. So basically, AMU and, and Avogadro's number are actually tied to each other. The size of one AMU is actually defined by this number, which is a little bit weird, but it winds up having a really useful um, useful use application, a useful application in terms of being able to measure these things and count um, properly. So are there any other counting units? You may think of any other unit that's not a whole unit, that's just a number of something, like a dozen or a mole. Has anybody ever heard of a gross? What's a gross? A dozen dozen, it's 144 of something. Um, but basically it's just a way, I'm just trying to make the point that all a mole is, is a counting number. And so you also need another unit on the end of it. Yeah. Couple? Yeah, couples too, right? Few is a little bit easier because depending on who you ask and where you are in the world, some people will say that a few means exactly three and some people will say it means two or three. Um, but couple pretty much universally means two. Um, if you want to, it's it's really interesting when you go away to college and meet people from other parts of the uh, country, ask them what all those sort of subjective numbering units uh, mean to them or where they come from. You'll get some interesting answers. Several. What does several mean? Is it more than a few? Is it the same as a few? Depends on where you live, actually. Um, one of the, just to give you an idea of how big a mole is, um, if you, if you covered the surface of the earth in ping pong balls, one mole of ping pong balls would cover the surface of the earth in a layer about a mile deep. It's a lot of objects. Um, I've also seen a, an interesting um, an interesting analysis by a by a uh, guy who was asked. Um, he's a PhD in physics and he used to work for NASA and now he just writes books for fun. Um, he was asked what what would happen if you had a mole of moles. So a mole, the counting unit of the small furry rodent. Um, it turns out a mole of moles would weigh about as much as the moon. Um, so, and that's using really, really fuzzy math estimating things, but within a factor of 10 about, you would have something that weighed close to the mass of the moon. Um, it then goes into the biology. What would happen to those poor moles stuck in the middle or those moles stuck on the outside? Um, do any of the moles actually survive if that happens? The answer is no, all the moles die. Um, the ones on the outside, die of asphyxiation, the ones in the middle um, get crushed by the gravity of all the moles on top of them. You wind up with mole soup in the middle, um, which over time would turn into petroleum. Always fun, right? All right. So how do we use this? Well, the, the most basic way we can use this number is just as a conversion. If we want to put a an actual number of, of atoms. Um, we can say, okay, if I have 1.45 moles of hydrogen, how many hydrogen atoms is that? Well, we just do as a conversion, 1.45 moles of hydrogen. One mole of anything has the same definition. 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd atoms of hydrogen. Moles cancels out with moles, we're left in atoms, right? So easy enough. Um, it doesn't matter what number we start with, right? And if we wanted to go the other way, if we had atoms and we wanted to get to moles, we, we've done enough conversions to know how to flip that over, right? As long as the top is equal to the bottom, it doesn't matter which one's on top, right? So if we had something like Uh, 
we'll do 3.72 times 10 uh, times 10 to the 17 carbon atoms. How many moles is that? Well, we want atoms to cancel out and be left in moles. So we're going to divide by 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd. Please excuse the interruption. Will Salvador Gonzalez Mendoza please report to the office? Salvador Gonzalez Mendoza, please report to the front office. Thank you. All right, so easy enough. If you want, but the reason to show this partly is to make sure you don't multiply by Avogadro's number when you're supposed to divide by it, right? Make sure that you cancel out atoms if you want to be left in moles. Make sure you cancel out moles if you want to be left in atoms. Easy peasy. Still doesn't really answer the question of why would we care about how many atoms we have. If we're dealing in moles of atoms, that works just as well because we can still say one mole of these compounds. So we could say if we had no uh, aluminum oxide, we'd say, okay, well, instead of saying I have one molecule of aluminum oxide, say I have a mole of aluminum oxide. And so they say, okay, well, one mole of aluminum oxide has two moles of aluminum atoms in it. One mole of aluminum oxide as three moles of oxygen. Or you could even say for every two moles of aluminum, you need to add three moles of oxygen. We're gonna start getting into using conversions as a way to predicting chemical reactions um, and how much we can make. So we wanna get used to thinking in terms of moles and thinking about these formulas as just one more place where we can get a conversion. We do the practice problem where it has you predict um, how many protons are in, and you know something times ten to the seventeen lead atoms? Did we do that one yet? I think on one of the the homework sheets. Um, probably one of the ones I haven't finished grading yet. That doesn't narrow it down very much, though, does it? Um, actually, I'm trying to get better at um, grading. I think I'm only two assignments behind, plus this last week's quiz, but. Um, we'll do some practice problems this week. Your, your assignment tomorrow, your homework assignment for this week is going to be doing some practice with these conversions in Avogadro's number. So you'll get some practice with it. All right. So I'm, I mentioned there's a connection between moles and AMU and that it was going to wind up being useful, have a useful application. Here's that useful application. Because 12 grams of carbon-12 has exactly Avogadro's number of atoms in it, and our definition of 12 AMU is the number of atoms in 12 grams of carbon-12, um, that allows us to say that one AMU per atom is one gram per mole. In other words, the atomic masses on the periodic table, they're technically in AMU. But nobody does anything in AMU because we're never actually dealing with one atom at a time. We're pretty much always going to be dealing with moles of atoms. And that allows us to calculate masses in terms of grams. So if I said I had one mole of aluminum atoms, how many grams would that be? Everybody should look at your periodic table. 26.98 grams. One mole of aluminum atoms is 26.98 grams of aluminum. This is useful because all of a sudden this allows us to go from something we can measure directly on a scale into how many atoms do we have? Moles of atoms in this case, but that's a number we can measure though. It's not so tiny that we that we're just talking about something that's practically impossible to, to visualize. 26.98 grams, you can weigh that. Might even have an idea of what 28 grams feels like. It's not very much. You know, probably three of those chess pieces, uh, maybe five of those chess pieces. There's gonna be about 20, 25, 30 grams. 
All right, so this is one more way we have. So we, we're gonna start using the periodic table as a giant conversion sheet. In addition to your regular conversion sheets, the periodic table is one giant conversion sheet as well. It tells you how many protons are in every nucleus. It tells you, um, and it tells you what the atomic mass is. In, in other words, how many grams do you need to get to one mole of those? Right, so if I wanted to know how many, if it's a compound instead of an element, I want to say, okay, one mole of water. What is that going to weigh? How do we measure one mole of water? Yeah, if, if this is all as one molecule, it's one compound, if we have a mole of water, we need one mole of oxygen and two moles of hydrogen to get one mole of water, right? So all we do is say, okay, well, two times the mass of hydrogen, which is 1.008 grams per mole, or just grams since we had moles on the other side here, plus one mole of oxygen, So not even just pure elements, but also any compounds that we know the formula for, we can use the periodic table to get this conversion to figure out how many pieces we have, how many water molecules are actually present, at least in terms of moles, and then it would be one more step. So if I said something like you have 75.0 grams of water, how many molecules of water is that? Well, we've got a conversion that allows us to go moles of water to grams of water. Well, every 18.007 grams is one mole of water. If I wanted to take that one step further and get molecules of water, how many actual objects there are, what's the next conversion? Yeah. We're just going to use Avogadro's number. One mole of anything is 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd. All right, so it's really just more conversions, just more specific versions of them. Still might not seem entirely um, useful. Okay, so now we can count how many objects we have. Um, when we get into chemical reactions, this is really powerful because chemical reactions always happen in terms of how many molecules you have, not in terms of how many grams do you have. So being able to go from grams to moles of something, it's going to be really, really important. Josie? Yes, I was wondering if I'd mentioned that before. Um, so on your calculators, there's usually a shortcut button for scientific notation so that you don't have to write it out by hand every time because that also messes with your order of operations because there's an exponent in there. Um, so if you see a button, if you have a Texas Instruments, a TI, anything, there's a button that's two capital E's next to each other. That's the button when you type that, it'll put just a capital E in wherever you're typing. So 6.02 E. And then you type a number. The E is shorthand for times 10 to the. So basically, instead of writing, writing it out, typing it into your calculator by hand every time, you can get to use this or know how to use this. It'll save you a lot of time uh, and headache. And most... Most calculators have, most scientific calculators have some version of this. It might not look like this button. You might have to play around with it to figure out what your, your calculator looks like. Um, but it's a really good habit to be in because it'll save you a lot of time if you get used to using it. All right. And that's a perfect place to stop. We'll have uh, practice problems tomorrow.
working on some of these new conversions and periodic properties. Oh, yeah. So I'm going to be going with the U-turns. Okay. Right, yeah. Um, I don't know what you guys are doing necessarily. 